Hello everyone and welcome to this year's Cimarron. I am very pleased to welcome our wonderful guest Shodona Orisa Kettle, who will be running this wonderful talk entitled Afro Ecuatorianidad, celebrating and recognizing Ecuador's black people. I will now like to read her profile very quickly. Shodona is from London, England of Jamaican descent. She is pursuing her PhD at University College London, where she also did her master's in globalization and development in Latin America and the Caribbean. Her thesis dealt with the human rights of Afro-Peruvians and she has also conducted research in Colombia and Ecuador. She has contributed to two UN reports on human rights for people of African descent. Shodona is the former president of the Haiti Support Group. She is also part of the collectives Mujer Afroec, Afrofeminas, Red de Investigadoras en Ciencias Sociales, and is a professor researcher at Universidad San Francisco de Quito. So, without further ado, Welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Shadonna Kettle and it's a pleasure to join you virtually to talk about this very important theme. Now, today I'm going to talk to you about Afro-Ecuadorians because I've been living in Ecuador on and off over the last three years and carrying out independent um, investigation about the Afro-Ecuadorian community, making friends with the Afro-Ecuadorian community, and um, generally showing an appreciation for Afro-descendant contribution to, to Ecuador, essentially. And I don't think that enough attention is, is paid to regarding Afro-Ecuadorians. So, I thought it'd be really interesting to, to share some information about the Afro-descendant population in Ecuador. And I do have some slides that I would like to, to share with you. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you will be able to, to see some of the slides that I've prepared. So the title of my presentation is Afro-Ecuatorianidad, recognizing and celebrating Afro-Ecuadorians. And we are in Black History Month in the UK, but we're also in Afro-Ecuadorian month here in Ecuador. So I thought it would be really um, useful to provide some context as to who exactly we mean or we're talking about when we say, when we use words like Afro-descendant, Afro-Ecuadorian. So I'd like to provide um, some context. Now I will be using two screens, so excuse me if my attention is diverted this way, which is where my presentation is. Okay, so in the Americas, the African diaspora encompasses around 200 million people, according to the Organization of American States. So that's approximately one third of the regional population. This number, which can be debated, is not exactly accurate. It's actually quite difficult to obtain accurate statistics on the number of Afro-descendants in the Americas due to the subjectivity of identity and self-determination. Therefore, this complex and multi-dimensional multi nature of race and ethnicity makes it difficult to actually capture the reach of the African diaspora in the Americas due in part to the historical and contemporary notion of white supremacy and black inferiority, which relegates Afro descendants to the bottom of the social hierarchy. So therefore, in some cases, this leads to an identity complex. Furthermore, the history and legacy of invisibility of Africans in the history of the region have made them forgotten people particularly in the censuses. So efforts were actually made across Latin America in 2010 that allowed for a, provision, a provisional estimate of the Afro-descendant population where for the first time in many countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, unfortunately, 
right? For the first time, these people were able to choose a category corresponding to their Afro descendants. So thinking about race and ethnicity and culture in the Black Atlantic, the African diaspora encompasses a Black modernity or a Black Atlantic that indicates a specific cultural and political creation leading to a transnational Black experience. There is no single definition of what it means to be Black because of the history of the triangular trade of slavery between Africa, the Americas, and Europe. According to Gilroy, Paul Gilroy, that is, being Black has no borders, it's transitory and dynamic. So Africans in the diaspora throughout history and in the present have been categorized as African or Black among other names with the intention of racializing, homogenizing, and grouping the different identities in Africa and America. So therefore, faced with structural discrimination and systematic oppression at all levels of society, the African diaspora has had to forge a kind of political identity, which has come in the form of Afro-descendants. The third world conference against racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and allied forms, um, which took place in 2001 in Durban, South Africa, as well as in its preparatory meetings, were a true paradigm shift for the African diaspora. This conference provided the necessary platform to articulate the fight against racial and ethnic prejudice at all levels. Afro-descendant leaders, intellectuals and activists from all around the world joined forces in their fight against historical discrimination. This transnational alliance strengthened the demands for social inclusion and political recognition. In fact, Ecuador was one of the first countries in Latin America to include race or self-identification in its 2001 census. The question was written as follows. What do you consider yourself? Indigenous, black, Afro-Ecuadorian, mestizo, mulato, white or other? The figures show that the Afro-Ecuadorian population in 2001 was at 4.9% or 604,009 people. Martinez argues that the prior invisibility of Afro-Ecuadorians in national um, statistics could have been due to the fact that the black social movement had not yet fully mobilized until the 1990s. Had it been fully developed, the results could have been different. The, st the statistics for the Afro-Ecuadorian population now is at 7.2% or just over a million um, people in the population. Okay, so this is according to the 2010 consensus, the last consensus that was done. Now, in, although the statistics have increased from 2001 to 2010, the numbers could still be even higher. But as I mentioned before, there is still... Um, a kind of complex regarding self-determination, okay? So Afro-Ecuadorians are in a constant battle for recognition in their own national territory, unfortunately. As a friend of mine, Naomi Chalam, who is a staunch activist, she affirms that being of African descent in Ecuador can sometimes make you feel like you're a foreigner in your own country, in your own country. And Dixon, who wrote almost 20 years ago now about the human rights of Afro-Ecuadorians, confirmed that Afro-Ecuadorians live in a culture dominated by mestizos that preaches the value of whiteness and the degra degradation of blackness and not having enough bargaining power in any of the influential spheres of society. Now, when we talk about terms like mestizo, for those of you who are not familiar, this usually has been promulgated or promoted as a mixture between white, 
um, and indigenous descent, leaving out the Afro um, or the African heritage component. So in, since 1534, when the Spanish brought enslaved Africans to Ecuador and founded Quito okay, with the help of Afro Africans, Afro Ecuadorians were subjected to alienation and colonization in conditions of, or under the conditions of slavery. Right? Faced with these oppressions, Africans were able to adapt okay, and forge a new culture in the Americas and not forget their contribution to key moments in history. The colonial economy, the construction of cities, temples and roads, the wars of independence, the liberal revolution, the construction of the railway, cocoa and sugar production, on farms, among other cultural, artistic, sports, and literary aspects, are things that we should not forget that African descendants in Ecuador have contributed to. Okay, so here you can see a map of um, a little bit of Colombia, and here we've got Ecuador showing the various provinces. Okay, so in these regions are where you can, um, where you will find a large population of Afro-Ecuadorians, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. They, Afro-Ecuadorians um, are dispersed throughout the country, you know, but this province here of Esmeraldas in the north coastal part of the country is celebrated as an ancestral territory for Afro-Ecuadorians because this is where the Spanish actually arrived and brought um, enslaved Africans to be sold and transported across the country. This province is also known for the Maroons. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Maroons or Simarunaje in Spanish, um, the idea or the concept of marronage is those, um, the African, the enslaved Africans who rebelled and resisted against colonial oppression, okay, against the colonizers and the settled, um, the settlers, and, um, and in, in, in essence created their own spaces where they were able to celebrate their culture and you know, bear in mind that not, not all Africans were from the same tribes, okay? They were taken at random, you know, forcibly removed from their native Africa, in their native tribes, and essentially had to create a new life in the Americas. So these Maroons created and forged spaces, carved out spaces where they could celebrate themselves and be free. And um, these Maroon Africans established autonomous territories that became their new homes, right? As we know throughout history, there were many shipwrecks and there were many shipwrecks in Ecuador as well. So in the province of Esmeraldas here, in 1540, after escaping from a shipwreck, the first free Africans settled in San Mateo. And there was another shipwreck in 1553, where 23 Africans from Guinea survived including Alonso de Iescas, an important African leader and now a national hero, okay? So after the um, abolition of slavery in Ecuador in 1852, some African descendant communities in, in Esmeraldas considered it appropriate um, to demand from the state the collective right to land, okay? So bearing in mind, there were maroon communities who were already um, free. They freed themselves, liberated themselves, but there were also others who after, you know, centuries of um, enslavement saw it fit to claim um, collective land rights. In the Chota Valley, um, this area is also deemed as uh, an ancestral settlement particularly in the Imbabura and Karchi provinces here that you can see just below Colombia. So do bear in mind that the Jesuits, the Spanish Jesuits who came and brought the enslaved Africans here to Ecuador were actually coming down from Panama, right? Bringing um, 
the enslaved Africans down from Panama all the way down to Ecuador. And, you know, let's bear in mind that there were rebellions along the way. They didn't come in chains, um, but they, you know, they rebelled. There were, there were resistances along the way. And talking about Cartagena in Barbuda, there are loads or there are many communities um, that have settled in the valleys, right, between the Chotamira Ria Rio, um, for example, in Ambuki, El Chota, El Juncal, um, Chalhuayacul, Guayupe, among others. In these ancestral territories, then, particularly in Esmeraldas, many of the Afro Ecuadorians are living in rural areas. Um, and they depend on ecosystems for their survival. Just like in um, the Pacific coast of here of Colombia, um, this is very fertile land, right? But, and these were the territories that African descendants were brought to work on the, the land and that essentially should have collective rights. But there are threats to ac of access to land and resources which lead to displacement. In fact, since the agrarian reform laws of, seven, of 1964 and 1973, African palm and, and shrimp plantations, gold mining, logging have claimed more and more ancestral territories. There have been legalization processes to hand over land titling to Afro-Ecuadorians, but unfortunately, the land is sold to transnational companies um, um, and not only in the Esmeraldas province, but also in the Chota Valle region, the Salinas and La Concepcion region. Okay, so this is just providing a bit of context for you as to where we can find um, predominantly Afro-Ecuadorian communities or people and some of the issues they face. It's also worth mentioning that here in Guayas is where you will find a large population of um, Afro descendants, Afro Ecuadorians, with the capital being, um, you know, Guayaquil is over here as well, which is the second largest city after Quito. <clears throat> so here are a few diagrams of of some of the territories where you um, will find Afro Ecuadorians. So I had the privilege of going to Cambio in the Esmeraldas province at the beginning of twenty. 18, beautiful region, and the Valle del Chota in the Imbabura and Karchi province. So it's, a, it's also worth mentioning that, um, that during the 1990s, there was a wave of constitutional reforms in the Americas, which celebrated multiculturalism and recognized racial, ethnic, and cultural differences of the national populations. You know? So indigenous and Afro-descendant populations were no longer, longer invisible, okay? So we spoke about the changes in the, um, in the censuses, right, in 2010, but even before that, towards the 90s, people were able to select whether they were Afro-descendant or not, or indigenous, or what have you. So these were meant to be special laws, um, that recognize these particular groups, indigenous and Afro-descendants, and in some cases they were granted collective rights. Now, in 1997, um, that year there came about by Congress, the National Day of Afro-Ecuadorian People, and it's to be celebrated on the first Sunday of October, and this is now extended to a month. And as a friend of mine, Catherine Chala, um, explained to me uh, when I asked her what does Afro-Ecuadorian Day or Afro-Ecuadorian Month or Afro-Ecuadorianidad mean to you, she replied that the National Congress of the Republic of Ecuador on the 2nd of October 1997 decreed the first Sunday of October of each year as the National Day of Afro-Ecuadorian People and recognized for the first time the, the Cimarron leader, Alonso de Yescas, who we mentioned earlier, an important African leader, as a national hero. But this was not done by Congress alone. This achievement was thanks to the struggles and the organization of some young 
um, Afro-Ecuadorians who were part of the Afro-Ecuadorian movement and managed to take this day um, from the Congress as an act of rebellion, you know, and justice. This day or month is not a party per se, but rather a, re a commemoration in which we remember our maroon heroes and how much they've contributed to our state, even as enslaved peoples. Okay, so I think that's really important to understand how people feel, how Afro-Ecuadorians in particular feel about celebrating and having the opportunity to be recognized at the national level for who they are as, as a people. I also ask some friends as to what it means to be Afro-Ecuadorian. And another friend of mine, Carla Viteri, who is a photographer and also founder of um, Pan-African movement called Addis Abeba, she says, now this is written in Spanish and I'll translate. I don't recognize myself as Afro-Ecuadorian. I'm Afro-descendant because I come from Africa. My roots are in Africa and not in the colony in which they enslaved my ancestors. Ecuador has nothing but exclusion and racism. My nation is the black nation. Okay, so this is coming from a very Pan-Africanist um, perspective and also demonstrates to us how um, people of African descent in Ecuador perhaps feel um, Ecuador treats them. I'll come back to the in a minute. Um, so another friend of mine, Edson Leon, who is a writer and philosopher, when asked to him, when asked, when I asked him what he thought of um, Afro-Ecuadorianidad and the celebration of Afro-Ecuadorian month, he says, for me, it's the people's fight, the Afro-Ecuadorian people's fight for their recognition and as a means of self-repair. Okay, and the theme of reparations is really interesting for me and it's a point I'm gonna come back to a bit later. Now, in turn, there has been an argument that the um, civil society organizations here in, Afro, in Ecuador aren't necessarily cohesive. There isn't a cohesive, coherent argument and, and the movement is disorganized. However, um, academics such as De La Torre and Anton point out the validity of the black social movement here in Ecuador together with that of indigenous people, okay? Because they came, these two groups came together to ensure that constitutional reform happened in 1998, as well as the 2008 constitutions. Um, there was a lot of ne negotiation and they were able to influence the language in this constitution. It was at that time that these um, Afro-Ecuadorians were actually recognized as a people. And there was also the creation of the National Council for, for Afro-Ecuadorian Development, which was signed by the former president, Rafael Correa, in 2009. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And also there was a law promoting, um, to promote and protect the rights of Afro-Ecuadorians, indigenous people and Mondubios, who are distinct ethnic groups here in Ecuador. And along with this decree, the public policy of the plurinational plan to eliminate racial discrimination and ethnic and cultural exclusion between 2009 and 2012 was drawn up with the aim of eradicating all forms of systematic racial discrimination and exclusion of these groups aforementioned. You know? um, so what, is what, what else is Ecuador doing in order to celebrate or recognize Afro-Ecuadorians? There is a legislative framework that recognizes the interculturality and multi multinationality of the country. For example, ethnic education. Afro-Ecuadorian ethnic education became an educational policy of the Ministry of Education through a ministerial agreement, which was promulgated in May 2016, whereby Afro-Ecuadorian ethnic education is recognized and implemented in the national education system. 
this is loosely based on, or basically based on the constitution, the 20, 2008 constitution and the organic law of intercultural education. And that specific agreement, agreement is 2016-0045. Um, again, here, the idea is to incorporate and celebrate, recognize afro ecuadorian contribution in the national history, because in many cases, the story of Afro-descendants has been um, raised in history, but doing it in textbooks, you know, and at the curricular level. And again, going back to my friend Naomi Chala, when I asked her what she understands by the term Afro-Ecuadorian or how she feels to describe herself as Afro-Ecuadorian, she says it's everything, um, it's who I am, part of my cultural um, features, my identity that I've inherited um, according to the ethnic group I belong to um, and my world vision. It's how I, um, and how I confront that particular world vision. And she also goes to say on interestingly that every day here in Ecuador, she feels that she is foreign or strange. And so you're in constant evolution of growth and change in order to adapt to society. And being Afro-Ecuadorian means having or valuing um, knowledge and learning about your, your ancestry voluntarily, you know, stepping outside of the traditional forms of storytelling but really going out of your way to learn more about your own um, ancestors. Because the history books in Ecuador speak about us very little or not at all. Being, mean, being Afro-Ecuadorian means being resilient. I thought that was really interesting. Um, something that Naomi shared with us. So here is Naomi. And another friend of mine, John Castillo, who works in the Ministry of Education, particularly in the Division of Ethnic Education, says for him being a descendant, it means being a descendant of Africans who arrived to these lands, they resisted, they fought for their liberty and conserved their cultural heritage. Okay, so Ecuador is taking steps to recognize um, African descendants through ethnic education, through their constitutional reforms, um, and also through the, the International Decade for People of African Descent. So if you're not aware of this, in um, 2013, on December the 23rd, the UN General Assembly declared that from the years 2015 to 2024, would be the celebration of the International Decade for People of African Descent with the theme, People of African Descent, Justice, um, Recognition and Development. And these themes emphasize the interrelation and interdependence of rights. Um, so without recognition and without justice, Afro descendants cannot fully participate or enjoy the benefits of development. So all of these three particular areas are interlinked and must be um, adhered to, promulgated. And in fact, in 2016, Ecuador um, issued an executive decree number 915, officially launching the decade. However, again, when you speak to Afro-Ecuadorians, unfortunately, the consensus is not enough is being done at the ground level among the grassroots, um, can, between the state and the grassroots, no, to really make this decade a reality. And there is a national coalition of Afro-descendants who are working to, um, to ensure that tangible steps are put in place to recognize, to officially recognize and, um, and respect this international decade. I also want to mention, so sorry, here is a quote from Jose Chala, who is a, um, a member of parliament and also was the director of the 
the National Council for the, Re the Development of Afro-Ecuadorians. And he said, you know, in 98, we were hardly recognized as, um, we were only recognized as a black people or Afro-Ecuadorians. The bigger question then is who were we before? We didn't exist. That's to say we were, we were there, but we were invisible, hidden, okay? And um, I had the opportunity to, to interview Jose Chalar a few months back when I was doing some more research. I'm going to, sorry that I'm skipping back and forth between my presentation. My slides got a bit jumbled up. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that, um, you know, I've not spoken a lot about the different difficulties that Afro-Ecuadorians face in society because I think the story is the same, unfortunately, worldwide where those who are not white essentially are um, struggling at the bottom. There are health um, issues, there are socioeconomic divisions in society with black people usually being at the bottom of the rung together with indigenous peoples and that Ecuador is no different unfortunately. Um, but you know, there are civil society organizations that are working and fighting against these injustices here in, here in Ecuador. Okay, so um, the, the civil society organizations or the black social movement here has kind of been gaining momentum since the, the late 1980s, 1990s, taking advantage of regional, um, multinational, or the celebration of multicultural societies and the different use of language you know, that was being used at the time to celebrate these communities. And, and at the national level here in Ecuador, we can think of musical advancements. So this is Papa Roncon, who is well known for his contribution to, um, to music and he's told the world. Um, and he's a marimbero, he plays the marimba, which you hear along the, um, in, particularly in the Esmeraldas province. Um, there are also the younger generations who are really showing their pride for their heritage through the arts. And this is a writer, poet, Juliana Ortiz. I do encourage you to follow her on social media because she has magnificent work. Um, we have the Afro-Ecuadorian um, vice mayor of Quito, Gisela Chala. Here is Jose Chala, member of parliament, whose name I earlier mentioned, and Sonia Riveros, who is very much um, an activist and deputy director of the Azúcar Foundation. And those, those um, Afro-Ecuadorians who are also fighting um, and showing off Afro-Ecuadorian beauty, you know? So particularly Carmen Mina, here, um, well-known national model. And um, this was actually a campaign idea of this model of here, Natalie Quinones, um, celebrating black beauty in, in Ecuador. And Miriam Orejuela, who has um, a page called Afro-Ecuadoriana's Hair, showing pride for Afro hair, um, in its natural state, right? And that's Naomi's um, explanation of what it means to be Afro-Ecuadorian. We also have the athlete Alex Quinones, who set a world or a national record. I can't remember, but he has run alongside um, the likes of Usain Bolt and Johan Blake, for example, fastest runners in the world. There is also Kimberly Minda, who is um, very much um, an activist, and she also has a page sharing information about four opportunities for youth in, um, in Ecuador. And she also works not only with the black community here, but also with the indigenous communities in Otavalo. And this was these few pictures were taken um, at some point last year where there was a celebration of Afro-Ecuadorianidad and um, Afro-Ecuadorians were invited to share um, their business ideas and the various entrepreneurial projects that they had going. So these 
are particularly related to Afro, Afro hair and really valuing your, your curls. It's really important to mention, some of you may know, that there were the um, protests last year among the indigenous communities that came together throughout Ecuador protesting against the, um, the threat of the removal of subsidies regarding oil and the Afro-Ecuadorians were also part of that movement but were not mentioned. So it's important to mention that the country does unite particularly the um, minority groups when it comes to claiming for their rights. Okay, so here are some of those pictures of Afro-Ecuadorians joining in that fight there. I'd also like to highlight that there is a campaign to ensure, regarding ethnic education, no, that there are courses dedicated to talking about Afro-Ecuadorian history and their contribution. And I was able to participate in a group, um, in a course rather, directed to Afro-Ecuadorian women, promoting training in, um, in politics and leadership, which was absolutely fantastic, a humbling experience. And here I have um, some pictures from San Lorenzo. We can see the marimba here in the background. So this is in the Esmeraldas province, and this is in the Imbabura and Karchi province, Valle del Chota. And this is the Mirabal River. And here, I don't know if this is so this was um, a video that I took when we visited the Esmeralda province in, in San Lorenzo um, and again celebrating black culture and that particular poem that that child was reading was about the pride of being black essentially. The UN um, experts and people of African descent visited Ecuador last year in December to meet with civil society to learn about the realities of Afro-Ecuadorian society and after that trip and meeting with various um, you know visiting the various pockets of society where you find Afro-Ecuadorian populations they um, they produced a preliminary report for the Ecuadorian state on how better to treat um, Afro-Ecuadorians, you know? And here, uh, this, these slides are actually in Spanish, but they relate to this idea of reparations and what reparations mean for the Afro-Ecuadorian society. And really it's recognition. So this is um, my friend, Maria Susana Cervantes, who says for her reparation implies making people aware that in principle, Africans and many of their leaders, African descendant leaders, are part of the national structure of building this country that is Ecuador. Okay, so really writing black people back into history and recognizing and celebrating their presence essentially and this is my last slide i believe which relates to the international decade for people of african descent and it's really a recommendation to the ecuadorian state that they should and must guarantee these three pillars of justice recognition and development incorporating all of the political agendas that they have um that they've essentially conjured up, but not actually taken tangible steps to make, um, to make changes, to make real changes in society. So really, I just want to end on saying uh, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. And that it's important for us to be aware of discrimination and human rights abuses that us as African descendants across the globe, and particularly in this case in uh, Ecuador face, but it's also important, it's imperative to celebrate, to recognize, to open up spaces, or even us creating our own spaces where we feel safe, we feel we're, we're, you know, people are listening to us, and that there is value, there's value in our presence, value in our contribution, and value in our histories. This is why we have things like Black History Month, or Black History Day, 
Afro-Ecuadorian Day, Afro-Colombian Day, what have you, Black History Month, because we've been written out of history and it's time to really change those narratives and um, show how historical discrimination plays into the present, but we can actually take steps to change, to change the present and the future. So thank you very much for listening. I do hope you've enjoyed it and you've learned something new about Afro-Ecuadorians um, in Ecuador. I'd like to thank Luz Elena for inviting me to be a part of the Cimarron Festival. It's been absolutely fantastic sharing with you all on these important matters, talking about black history, about Afro-descendants. Thank you very much.